So I need five volunteers. You do have to wear your mask when you come up. And then I'm just going to have you spread out along the front of the stage. I promise not to embarrass you any more than having you hold something for me. So uh, if you can just picture Wheel of Fortune, you get to be my Vanna White. And I need five of you. And you don't even have to wear you know, high heels and a dress. Five people. Do I have five? One, two. Okay, if I can have one of you stand there and just, okay, come on up. Here we go. There's five. So just kind of spread out across there. And I'm going to give you uh, some, some statistics, and we're going to have a little fun with probability. So let's go this route first. So what I think is interesting is most kids who play sports at a young age want to go pro in those sports. So I thought it would be interesting if we saw what the odds of that would be. So for the kids who desire to go pro, 33% of all kids in sports desire to go to pro at something, uh, about 1 in 2,500 uh, actually make it there. So we're going to pass out some numbers here. If we could do 2, 5, Zero, zero. I think that we've got this figured out. So one in 2,500. And you want to guess at how many of these actually make it on the field for a meaningful game? Very few. Very few. So it's rough, right, to make it into uh, pro athletics. I thought it would be interesting to know how many, how many people actually get struck by lightning. What's the probability? And it's actually one in 1500 or excuse me one in 500 so we have the five right let's take that that one away very good 500 one in 500 can get struck by lightning what are the odds that you're going to have twins naturally be be careful with this i know it's it's covid and people are quarantining so this is your odds of having twins naturally and it would be 1 in 250. So I'm going to drop the 2 back over here, pick up the 0, 1 in 250. Guys, do you realize how easy that is? 250 is not that many people. Be careful out there. <laughs> All right, how about your odds of having triplets naturally? The odds change a little bit more so here, and it's actually 1 in... Got to make sure I get this right. I don't want to mislead anybody. One in 9,000. So let's, uh, let's start with a 9 over here. I think we're going to need a few more zeros. So here's the 9. I'll take your other numbers. And you need a 0. You've already got a 0. I think we're at 9,000. Does that look about right? Check my math here. One in 9,000. How about quadruplets? This gets a little trickier, right? What are the odds, naturally again, that you can have quadruplets? And so here are the odds. 1 in 572,000. So we're going to start again with a 5. I'll take your 9 back. I'll take your 0 back. It is a little crazy dropping all of these numbers here, but I want to make sure that we're good to go here. 7... And I'll give you a two, and I'll take your zero, and yeah, I'll even let you hold two of them if I can find two here, because I think that's right. Is that 572,000? Woo! It's a miracle. What are the odds of getting this right? Okay, now this one gets, I think, really tricky, because most of us would like to hit a jackpot of some sort, right? And so, what are the odds that you and I in America can become millionaires. And so I've got a few numbers here. Uh, let's see, who's got the two? I'll take that one. And uh, so I'm going to start with these guys down here. I'm going to trade this out. Give me that zero. And you can have this. I'll take this one and this one. So your odds of being a millionaire are 1 in 32 in America. Whoa. One in 32. 
Now, most of you are thinking, yeah, once I hit the lottery, this is going to be a piece of cake. I will be a millionaire. Once I become a pro athlete, do you understand that your odds of being a millionaire are much, much greater than that of becoming a pro athlete in America? That's crazy. But what if we were to amp this up a little bit and say, well, how about being a billionaire? Because, I mean, a million dollars just doesn't go very far anymore today. So the odds of being a billionaire, I need five seven and nine so we have a seven here and i gave you guys three and two so five seven nine very good and i'm going to take those numbers from you guys now it's not 579 so don't get too carried away i need a few zeros to add to that and so once again give you your zeros back. I mean, I hate. We got Robert Parrish up here. That's going old school, I know. 579,000. Now, let me share with you again. Your odds of being a billionaire are about as equivalent to that of having quadruplets naturally. So, I mean, it's, it's big odds, right? The odds are kind of stacked against us. Now, what are the odds that, you know, you and I can hit the Powerball. You see the big billboard in town, right? They put it up so big that everybody sees it. What are the odds I, should, I could actually hit the Powerball? So I need a few different numbers. Uh, two, and this gets a little tricky because I'm burying the numbers as we go. A two and a two here. Trade you out. I'll take that one from you. If you pass your nine over. And there's your two. And then we need uh, a few zeros here on this one. So actually, why don't we, you want to pass that one on to Kaylin. She's going to hold two of them. You're going to pass yours down. And you're going to need a couple of those. And I'll give you a couple of these. Okay, help me out with the zeros here, because this may be a little hard. So the odds are actually 292 this is 1,000, right? Up to this point, 1,000. Okay, here's another one of those. And now we're at what? <laughs> it should be 292, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 million. 292 million. Okay, your odds of becoming a millionaire, guys, one in 32. How many of those millionaires do you suppose won the lottery? About none of them. About none of them. Because the ones that win the lottery squander it and they have nothing. That is the odds, right? So if you want to become a millionaire, chances are you're either born into it or you work your rear end off. That's how you get there. Right, But a million dollars really in the, the name of the game here in the United States is attainable. One in 32. It's, it's doable. So if you hit it, just remember connection when you give. Right? Just saying. Right? So that is a, a few pieces of odds. And then I thought it would be interesting for us to note how likely it is that we would become President of the United States of America. And so... Here are the numbers. Make sure I get this right. I'm going to give you a three. And I'm going to take those two. All right, so we are at, what's our number here? One, two, three, one, two, three. We are at three million. Well, we need a couple of these. Would you pass your three down? There you go. How's that looking? Three hundred million. Now, consider this for a moment. This is the statistical odds that you can become president. But in reality, with the way that things are stacked up in the United States of America today, unless you were born into wealth, or you have gone to a prestigious university, or you have attained a, a, like a governatorial or a senate or a house seat, your odds are extremely low. Extremely low. So just to get to this point, you have to have a lot of things go your way. 
But that is an incredible odds. Now the reason I share all of this is because we're going to be talking about the odds of Jesus being the Son of God. And how this all stacks up, stack up. Can we give our guys a hand? I'll take all your numbers back. Feel free to use those hand sanitizer pumps. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so that is going to uh, prove to be extremely fun and exciting. All of these odds, the reason I printed it out this way, guys, is I wanted you to get an idea just how big these numbers are. Especially when we see them before our eyes. Because we can hear things, and it just doesn't quite make the same measurement. So when you see 32 stacked up to 3,000, it looks different. Right? When you see 32 stacked up next to 300 million, it looks a lot different. Right? And the odds are that if I asked you if you wanted a 1 in 32 chance of winning the lottery versus a 1 in 572 million chance, you'd probably say, I'll take the 32. And if I said, would you rather have $572 million or 32? The odds are you would say 572. Right? Numbers mean something. The zeros when put in the right place, mean a little something for us. So up to this point, finding Jesus, it's about finding Jesus in the Old Testament. And we've actually been kind of looking at a string that carries its way through the Bible. So week number one, we talked about Jesus being the Messiah or the Christ. And we utilized Psalm 110. And we saw from Psalm 110 how many times it was quoted by Jesus in the New Testament and other authors in the New Testament, as well as it referred to a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and it took us all the way back to Genesis, but also took us to Hebrews, where it unpacks what it means to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the reason that we did that uh, is to show you God's faithfulness, but it also shows you that it's really impossible to believe that Jesus is the Son of God without believing the entirety of Scripture that's been laid before us. Because even though it's been written over thousands of years and it's thousands of years old, it still has one seamless story. And it's incredible when it all comes together. Uh, last week, we shifted gears a little bit and we went to Psalm or excuse me, I think it was uh, Isaiah chapter 53. And we talked about the suffering servant and how Isaiah weaves itself as well into the New Testament. And you can see it lived out in the disciples. You see it quoted by Jesus. And again, you see this idea that He is indeed uh, the Son of God who came here to suffer in our place. And many of you guys took the opportunity to go uh, nail your sins and make a confession before God. Just the same way that they would cast their sins on the scapegoat and send it off. And that they would kill the, the atonement sacrifice. And so we got to see how Leviticus and Exodus kind of roll their way into this seamless story. Well, today is going to look a little bit different because we're actually going to take seven different accounts. And if you've been reading along in Core 52, then you know these seven accounts that are listed here. I'm going to change up one just a little bit for us, but I want us to see how this picture plays out. So the core verse for this particular chapter is actually found in Psalm chapter 2. And this is not one of the seven that we're going to... uh, figure into our statistical odds, but I think it's one that gives us a good idea of what we're talking about. Psalm chapter 2. So roughly in the middle of your Bible, and then you can adjust from there. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 2 is a prophecy about the trials of Jesus. And we continue on into to verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, As for me, I have set my King on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree... The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This particular passage is quoted two times in the ministry of Jesus. 
One would be at his baptism. So Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. The heavens part and a loud voice from heaven says, This is my son whom I love and in whom I'm well pleased. A direct quote from Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. But it's also there in the, uh, the transfiguration. So uh, Jesus goes with his most trusted disciples and there he sees some of these fathers of the faith that are there before. And so this had to be just a miraculous, miraculous event. And again, the voice of God saying, this is my son whom I love. Wow. Verse 8, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of your earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. We're talking about the rule of Christ. This isn't the salvation. This is the rule of. This is Him exercising His authority and bringing deliverance. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. So just in this passage alone, one chapter of the Old Testament, we see three different prophecies coming out of that. And there are way more prophecies than that in the Bible. Matter of fact, I've come into a couple of different numbers and uh, scholars are a little bit off on where these numbers align, but roughly 60 major prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the Messiah, the anointed Son of God. Roughly 60 of them. And if you, you take into account every passage of Scripture that could be viewed as a prophecy towards the, the coming Messiah, it's nearly 400 different prophecies. So the odds that these prophecies are going to be fulfilled are extremely slim. Can we agree on that? Extremely slim that anyone is going to be able to measure up to these standards. But here we go. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is the the cool thing about where we are today. For the most part, we're going to be in Matthew and then the minor prophets that exist right before Matthew. So the very end of the Old Testament and the very beginning of the New Testament. So even if you're moving back and forth, you get to move back and forth a few pages. Okay, so we're going to start in in Micah chapter 5. And so when I read from the Old Testament, I'm going to stand on this side, and then we're going to draw the string that connects it to the New Testament. Okay? So here's number one. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. What I want us to see in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, is that this is going to come from Bethlehem. Right? And when we talk about these, these people groups, we're talking about the, the significance, and we're talking about the lineage. Like these people settled in, in their family groups, and so from Bethlehem. Now, if we kick just a few... Uh, pages over into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in, what's that word there? Bethlehem of Judea. In the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And he assembled the chief priests and the scribes and all the people, and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, where is this? In Bethlehem of Judea. For it is written by the prophet, this is a quote of Micah chapter 5 verse 2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for whom you shall, from, for whom you shall come a ruler, who it will shepherd my people Israel. 
So we've just connected the first string from the Old Testament, Micah 5.2, to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2. This Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Now, when we read it in Matthew chapter 2, it doesn't say the Messiah, right? It gives us a name, and the name is Jesus, right? So this is the name that we're watching as we make this thing go. So Malachi, Malachi, just a, a page or two back in your Bible if you're uh, looking through. If you're on the app, I think all of these things are at least referred to there, so you can be able to look those up pretty easily. Math, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to, you, to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So the prophecy here is that before the Messiah comes, there will be a messenger. Right, So we kick over to Matthew, again, this time Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verses 9 through 11. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Among those born of men, no one greater than John the Baptist, who came as a messenger before who? Jesus. And that little piece in parentheses there in verse 10, guess what? That is a quote of the passage that we just read in the book of Malachi in chapter 3. Okay, there's two strings attaching the Old Testament prophecy to this New Testament Jesus. We move on to number 3. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah is... Just a bit before Malachi, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. So how do we see this Messiah entering in? On a young donkey. Well, that's crazy. That's a pretty specific prophecy. But yet, we can go to uh, Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, we get to see this picture unfold. Verses 1 through 7. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethagy, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and He will send them at once. This is kind of crazy. Some of these prophecies you cannot possibly have control over. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Can He have control over that? Did you have control where you were born? I think not. Right? And then he's got this messenger going before him. Could he control who was coming before him? No. Not very likely anyway. Could he control whether or not he came in on a donkey? Yeah, he can control that. Matter of fact, he even told the disciples, hey, yo, go grab the donkey and the colt, which is also kind of crazy because he knew where they were. Now, I don't know, did he walk by them the day before and he's like, yeah, I I saw where the donkey was parked. This would be easy. Or did he just know? Right? And and then when he's like, so if they come out and they say, hey, hey, what are you doing with my donkeys? You just tell them, the Lord needs them. Oh, the Lord, okay, whatever, just take my donkeys. That's cool. Like, there are some things that seem a little strange here, but if we continue to read on, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, 
Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Any guesses where that quote comes from? Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. So the odds are getting a little bit bigger here. So one strand goes back, right? And so we're talking about Micah. And then we grab Malachi, and we attach that one. And now we're in Zechariah, but let's continue in Zechariah for a little bit. Zechariah chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. Okay, so this one is about what? It's about getting beaten, right? And it's about the disciples scattering afterwards. So again, go back to Matthew. This time, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. So we're kind of making our way through the life of Christ. We're seeing how it's chronicled in Matthew, but we're seeing the connections to the Old Testament prophecy. Matthew chapter 36, verses uh, 31 through 35. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That sounds really familiar. Zechariah 13 maybe? But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And the disciples did the same. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. There is a prophecy even by Jesus that I'm going to go and die. And that you will deny me, Peter. And this is where you and I kind of come into the picture a little bit, right? Because you and I, at some point in time, we are Peter in this story. And Jesus says that you know, there will come a, a time where you deny me. There will be a time that you turn your back on me. The odds will be stacked against you. You will be afraid of what people might say. There might be conversations, spiritual conversations, that I'm going to guide you to, and you're going to stay quiet. There's going to be opportunities to boldly proclaim your faith, and you will have your mouth shut. You will be as though Peter saying, I don't know the man. Right Now, this isn't a guarantee for all of us, but I think most of us would say that there are times the Spirit has prompted us to share something, and you and I have become mute. And we don't really speak into that. Maybe those conversations are at the workplace, or maybe they're with your friends, right? Friends who don't know Christ. Maybe they're with your family. Some of you got the opportunity this last week to spend time with family. And there were opportunities to share your faith and to share what Jesus has done in your life. You've kind of backpedaled a little bit. Right? But our point is this, that again we go from Zechariah chapter 13 to Matthew 26. And we see that the disciples are going to be scattered. How about Zechariah chapter 11? Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Then I said to them, If it seems good to you, give me my wages. But if not, keep them. And they weighed out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price, lordly price at which I was priced by them, So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. 
Zechariah chapter 11. Matthew chapter 26 again. This one we're going to hit a couple different uh, sections of Scripture here. We're going to start in verses 14 through 16. And then we're going to go to uh, verses uh, 27, 1 through 7. So 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him how much? Thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Chapter 27, verse 1. And when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. And then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, into the Lord's house, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and brought with them the potter's bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Now this is crazy. This one's a two-parter, right? 30 pieces of silver. Oh, they called that the price of a slave. And not only that, but it's going to be thrown into the Lord's house, the temple. And it's going to be given to the potter. And they bought the potter's field as a place to bury those who didn't have a place to be buried. That's crazy. All this stuff coming from Zechariah to Matthew. And so here we are, number one, born in Bethlehem. Number two, preceded by a messenger. Number three, riding on a donkey. Number four, the sheep will scatter. Number five, 30 pieces of silver. And we're going to have two more. This one, they would not open their mouth. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. This is the one that we hit last week, so you have to go back a little bit further to get to this one. And again, it's roughly uh, in the middle of your Bible, uh, more towards the back than than uh, the front, but Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Well, we can get past the idea of the sheep because, I mean, John the Baptist, the messenger that went before, said, hey, look, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world and its connection to the Passover that goes all the way back to Exodus. Uh, but for now, we go to, uh, again to the book of Matthew, and we're in chapter 26, verse 59. Matthew 26, verse 59. And we'll take 59 through 63. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last, last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Now he was talking about his body. They thought he was talking about the temple itself. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And this is where he answers. But before all the accusations, he remains quiet. He says, You have said so. You have said so. Sixth string. Number seven. Just to finish it off for good measure, we go to Psalm chapter 22. And this one again, towards the middle of your Bible, Psalm 22. This time in verse 16. 
For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. They have pierced my hands and feet. Matthew chapter 27. Verses 22 and 23. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. What we know about crucifixion is that it was about nailing the hands and the feet. They would pierce them. Right, so what does all of this mean? Like, why are we connecting all of these dots? Well, maybe for somebody, this is an opportunity to do a little apologetics and a defending of the faith, right? And you're trying to, to figure out how to tell somebody else that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Or the Bible is real. Like, it, it actually, like, it connects the dots. This is crazy. Or maybe this is an opportunity for you to go, okay, yeah, I get it. I finally get it. Like, Jesus is the Son of God. Right? There's no way that all of these guys could have put these pieces together and Jesus comes in and he fulfills all of these. But for some of us, we simply know, need to know that God is faithful. Right? That he can be trusted. That all of these things that they said in the Old Testament were fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And the odds that any one person would be able to fulfill all seven of these is amazing. And so if I could get nine volunteers up here, can I have the original uh, five that came up? And then if you can just spread out across the front again. I'm going to make sure I've got all the papers here that we need to make this happen. We're going to try this. One, two, three, four, five, and I need four more. There's one, two, three, four. Good. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to start over here. You get a one and a zero. Zero. Trying really hard not to lick the pages. Zero. <laughs> Yeah, zero, zero, zero. Guess what your no next number is? Zero, zero score. You're going to get some zeros, man. You are correct. I don't want a zero. Zero, zero. zero to hero, buddy. Zero yeah. to hero. One, two, three. I get rid of some twos and sevens and fives here. Give you a zero, a couple zeros. I'm getting too close to the outside. All right, so the odds, according to one author, that one man could fulfill just these seven prophecies. How many did I say major prophecies? Does anybody remember? 60. About 60. How many total prophecies? Yeah, roughly at least, you know, 400. And that's just from guys who are kind of skimming through trying to figure out, like, what, what's prophecy and what's not prophecy. And just from these seven, the odds are 100 quadrillion. Quadrillion. Okay, look at all those zeros for a moment. So the odds are much greater that you're going to make it into the professional athletics your odds are much greater than you're going to have quadruplets, right? That you're actually going to win the Powerball. Then one man can have a fulfilling just these seven prophecies. Boom, right? This is Jesus stepping up to bat, and he's fulfilled the rest as well, right? Can we give these guys a hand? You can just drop your numbers on the front. So what's your next step? What does all of this stuff mean?
Because if you and I just come in here and we encounter the information, it doesn't necessarily lead to anything. Right? Some of you may come in here as a Christian and you leave as a Christian that's just like, oh, that was cool. Right? But what I want you to see is that God is faithful. God is trustworthy. And you and I are supposed to be messengers that go before this Messiah that other people would come to know that He is indeed the Son of God. That He has the power to resurrect the dead, to change lives, to impact a culture, to radically transform lives. Right? And so I'm going to ask you a pretty pointed question. Because if we're to call ourselves Christians, that means we are followers of Christ. We are imitators of Christ. And if God is that trustworthy, are you? Because if you and I are not faithful, if you and I are not trustworthy in what we say, in what we do, in the commitments that we make, then when you and I try to introduce somebody into the the life-changing grace of Jesus Christ, they may see muddy water. Right? They may not see how true and faithful God really is. Now, I understand, right? We are all sinners, and we fall short of the grace of God time and time again, right? But I think it's super important that you and I understand that that Jesus came to die in our place, but he uses us to be messengers to reach the next generation, And the more we can align ourselves with what God is is doing through the person of Jesus Christ, that we can be His character and His likeness, the more likely somebody's going to see Jesus in us and be radically transformed by Him. But this comes only through believing that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God. And that you are identifying, submitting to His Lordship Right? And that you are shining his light wherever you go. And my prayer is that this Christmas time, where people are probably the most susceptible, right, to, to an invite into the church, that you would find one or two or three people that you can invite from your family unit, from your group of friends, from your coworkers, and you can invite them into this life changing relationship with Jesus. Not an invite to connection as much as it is an invite to hear the story of God at work. Who is God placing on your heart? And what are you doing intentionally on your own behalf to share the light of Christ? So many times, guys, we can even place that invite, and that invite is a tough ask. Then we leave it up to the church to make disciples. And nowhere in Scripture do we say... Invite them to church so that the pastor can make them disciples. He says to the believers, go and make disciples. You don't have to have the answers, but you have to be willing to have the conversations. And those conversations, guess what? When they give you tough questions, it'll drive you to find the answers. And you will grow in your faith the same time that you're sharing that love with somebody else. And so I hope that your next step is to trust God who brings us Jesus. Or maybe it's to be trustworthy and go and share this message or simply to go and make disciples. Invite them in. Invite them into your small group. Invite them for a cup of coffee and let them know that God is faithful. Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here. Amidst all of the stuff that's going on in our world today, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this same God who is prophesying through the Old Testament and is fulfilling so much in the New Testament, who is going against all odds, will step into our lives and go against those same odds. And when we think that we are unworthy to be loved, we know that we have a Savior who goes against those odds. When we think that we have a family member or a co-worker that will never accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we understand that we have a God who raises the dead and goes against impossible odds to save those whom He wants to call home. Father, help us to not stand in the way, but to be trustworthy servants who are willing to go and make disciples. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.